This is a 74-year-old male with a history of ischemic cardiomyopathy and severe aortic stenosis who's referred for a TAVR assessment. And here I hope you'll appreciate on the three-chamber, you know, again, a, a very bad heart, uh, signif significantly depressed ejection fraction. You can see a heavily calcified aortic valve. And just by the Doppler hemodynamics, you know, still able to generate a very good gradient. And this patient was, you know, um, a good candidate for TAVR. Um, I want to show you his right side of his heart because, you know, that's kind of where my, my case is all about. And I hope you'll appreciate that his right ventricle looks enlarged in, this, in these views as well as his right atrium. But you're, you're saying it's enlarged without a CMR? <laughs> <laughs> Crazy. <laughs> What's the yes. cut? Yeah, okay. Enlarged. <laughs> Okay, um, and then you'll see some tricuspid regurgitation, and you can see the Doppler profile of that. Uh, it's not early peaking, it's not triangular and shaped, um, and you know that this TR was felt to be, you know, mild, mild, moderate at best. What's what's the velocity there in the TR? Uh, let's go back here. But almost three, or a two eight or something. Two and a half. A two and a half. Okay. So mild pulmonary hypertension, yeah. is what we'd say. Despite coming up. Despite coming up. That is a good question. I, that that information I don't have for this talk. <laughs> <laughs> That's a, that, that's a huge gradient for that I, I can't believe your, I, I can't believe your LV stroke volume is an index of more than 35 cc's. Yeah, that's a very tight index. Yeah, yeah. It's a very tight index. Yeah. The ventricle is huge. But you still get, but. The ventricle is huge, so although you may have, you may have about 20%, you know, you yeah. end up with a stroke volume of about 45 cc's or something like that. Yeah. Okay, well, that, but that's probably, I, mean, I guess how, if this guy's pretty big, that's still a really low stroke volume, so I'm still surprised he can generate that type of gradient, which makes me wonder, when I see something that doesn't make sense, I wonder if I'm missing something. And we often see that, and you, you wonder what it is about this heart compared to some other dilated heart that it's able to generate velocities and gradients like it is. Well, what, um, what I would love to see for academic reasons, because not for data reasons, this guy is obviously but for academic reasons, it's great to see how much fibrosis by CMR. Yeah. Because my theory would be that this is a very high actual situation that hopefully will improve after tower in terms of the area versus a dead heart with a low fibrosis. So I would have been very curious, but it really is an academic reason because I don't think it would change what we would have do. So, so so Faisal, like, like we do in the conference regularly, what's, what's the clinical question dilemma? Uh, that's coming up. Okay. That's coming up. Okay. So uh, this was just his, and I, I brought these, this set of images. This is his post-TAVR EF. Well, that um, answers one question. The, the ventricle. Now up to post-TAVR. Yeah, he got, he got his TAVR. His, you know, we don't see any perivalvular leak. We still have that tricuspid regurg, and it looks about the same. This is early post TAVR. This is, yeah, definitely probably day one or day two EF, you know, yeah, this is not a ventricle that's remodeled yet. Did the EF improve at all? Was that the thinking? Um, eventually it improves, uh, but yes, in, in this particular case, it was read out as, you know, same, severely depressed. But, I, I, you know, if you look very closely in one of these images, you'll notice that this patient has um, some, you know, conduction disease problems and well, uh, from the, the um, uh, what do you call it, uh, uh, self-expanding devices, you, we've, you know, he has a heart rate here in the 30s, and this eventually led to the placement of a bi ICD in this gentleman. And here is some images that were taken post-device placement, and uh, I hope you can appreciate that the tricuspid regurgitation has significantly increased here in this four-chamber view. And then again here in the RV inflow view. The dynamics of the hemodynamics also were consistent with severe TR. Now you can see a more triangular um, early peaking jet uh, consistent with significant tricuspid regurgitation as well as now flow reversal in the hepatic veins. So um, the issue was 
Would you all consider, what, what would you like to do next? So, I mean, is the thinking of this is a jailed, tricuspid lead? put in the pacemaker properly? That was, a, that led to our next test. How's he doing clinically? Clinically, the patient uh, comes back, legs are swollen. Improved from pre-taver, but, you know, still swollen. They tried diuresis. They tried diuresis. Um, they're working on that. Um, actually, what happened in this particular case, they chose further imaging to see if they could figure, they could see if they could see any uh, so you know, lead that was What was the was timeline with that echo you just showed? Was that a month, or is this still in hospital after Taver? No, this was out in, this was back in clinic, maybe. Probably a month or a six month weeks later. or something. Okay. So this led, this led to a CT, and um, I hope that the lead here is the very bright, shiny object. So you can here see it here in the short axis view of the tricuspid valve, as well as in the RV view here. And I hope you'll agree, just by looking at these images, that this posterior leaflet definitely looks impinged or um, um, by uh, th this lead, and definitely is probably the cause for um, why this patient is having significant tricuspid regurgitation. So at this next, at this junction, based on these images, it was decided that they will go ahead and try to revise the lead. So Faisal, let me stop you there. So we've seen a lot of 4 CT at this meeting. And you know, I think back then we weren't doing 4 CT. If you had a 4 CT that you could look right down on the sort of short axis view of the tricuspid valve, would that help determine whether you've truly jailed the leaflet? Because you, know, you can do a lot of things. You, you could just have a... I'm, some I don't of the see images the that you saw, what, what they'll do is they'll they'll null the blood uh, the blood pool, so you can see the tissues a little bit better, and yeah. you know it's a little bit. I see the lead and I see the, the leaflet, but I don't see that the lead is stopping the leaflet. Here, look at this view. I see it. I see it. Okay. Not convinced, I'm not convinced. Steve. Okay. I'm suspicious, but I'm not convinced. Okay. How would you believe that this patient's uh, symptoms would improve knowing that his annulus was dilated if you were to revise the lead, I guess would be the main question here in this case. I mean, he's got more than one potential reason for TR. So, you know, in some people, it's not inconsequential to take out that lead and to move it around. He's in one month out. And it got, and we have serial echoes where, you know, this was definitely the cause of his worst TR. So to me, that was advocate. This is a gorgeous picture, and I think it really shows almost completely. But with the doctor's thinking, the likelihood was very likely. So do you really need this beautiful picture at $700 more to make the decision to revise the lead? I'm just asking. I would. I would because uh, something else happened. That, that was post taver leading to the by VICD. The, the, uh, the conduction problems were post taver. Yeah, he was. He had a high degree AV block. I'm sorry. One more time. Right, so this, you're talking. Aha. You know, sometimes this is the difficulty, I think, also not being at the workstation. At the workstation, this is a lot more convincing. And it's, you know, it's really the plane where I've captured this image. I, you know, this. What you're seeing is a post, but then I think what's happening is during systole, what you're seeing is coaptation. That's the anterior leaf that comes against it, right? Because if you look at the, the lower left image, you can see actually where the lead sits. It sits right over the posterior leaflet, right? 
but there's the anterior leaflet or the septal leaflet that comes together. So I think it's kind of going out of plane. So what you're seeing there, I don't think is the leaflet itself. That's not the posterior leaflet's coapting. Okay, so By this, now this, I could have fixed this, that this The other you. issue I'll just say technically from the CT standpoint is, you know, we also have inferior temporal resolution here. So some of, you know, whether you're seeing true coaptation or not, maybe also temporal resolution issues. Okay, let, let's carry on. We, uh, we're suspicious of the tricuspid valve interference by the lead. I, I think it, I, I would say more than suspicious. I mean, you're giving me some hints up there on the top of your slide, Faisal. Yeah, yeah, I, I purposely chose pictures to try to convince That's why people. they say look at all corners of the slide. <laughs> <laughs> that and also I was hoping the serial progression of echoes that I was showing. Um, but okay, so our electrophysiologist went ahead and revised this lead. And uh, I think you took the clicker, Steve. So if, <laughs> no, it's, it's okay. Total control. <laughs> Next slide. <laughs> Auto control. Uh, okay, so um, what he what they decided to do there's there was a very nice study um, published in 2014 where they pretty much took every device that they implanted and they used um, a 3D echo uh, to decide placement of the leads, and so based on that uh, uh, principle, um, they went ahead and revised the leads using um, intracardiac or ice. And he, you know, per the surgical records, the lead was definitely now positioned in the center of the leaflets. Um, patient came back to clinic and um, reportedly, per the clinic notes, definitely felt better. Um, however, you know, here was the echo. So, you know. Well, what All is right. it? Okay. Was because in the first in the first shot you had the triangular uh, pattern of the ER. Now it's now it's rounded. So the D wave in the RA has gone down. So there, there has been a benefit by color. You still see a lot of color, right? but that pattern is a very different pattern to what you showed earlier, which was triangular, meaning a big okay, that wave. Now you probably have some elevation, but not with the same magnitude. So Fazal, in this image, the, the difference between having a lot of so the lead is across the valve. The ice says it's not impinging. It, it's, yeah, it's, it's not impinging on any okay. leaflet in the center of the valve. Okay. Um, unfortunately, you know, it, yeah. The so mic explains something. So, so your, your velocity is bigger than it was before. It was two and a half before, now it's two eight. No, it's simple. It's simple, Mark. Well, I don't know. That looks, the one on the left looks no, like it goes all the way through. Remember in the pre tabar. Yeah. It's not in pre tabar. The one that he showed after tabar. Okay. So I, the reason I brought this case, and it was really in conjunction with my earlier cases, there's a lot of thoughts as to, you know, what is the mechanism why, you know, some patients improve post-lead revision and other patients don't. And one of the, th one of the prevailing theories uh, that are, is out there is that, you know, uh, you, the initial insult for a patient to develop tricuspid recurrence, of course, could be the device um, uh, placement and in the impingement of a lead. This eventually sets up the cycle of where you have tricuspid regurgitation. This leads to RA and RV enlargement, which further leads to tricuspid annular dilation. Tricuspid annular dilation then, of course, unfortunately, leads to more TR, and this becomes a vicious cycle. So I, I think. That's where clinically it becomes um, more challenging for us in, as physicians is if we see uh, a patient who has a device with significant TR, you know, is the, dil uh, is the tricuspid dil uh, annulus already dilated? In those patients, really how much benefit will we be able to afford our patients? Thank you,